my name is Chris Harris and I'm from AlloryTutors.com and um, this video is basically we're just going to go through uh, AQA, atomic structure, um, so this is specifically for AQA um, and uh, basically we're just going to go through um, the, the key points just as revision, it's a good overview of the topic to make sure that um, you've covered most of the things that you need to know um, and just before I start, um, the PowerPoints that I'm using here that I've made uh, they are available to uh, to purchase. If you just click on the link in the comments box uh, just below, then you should be able to uh, click on that and you'll be able to buy them there. If you're interested, it'd be great for things that you can print them off or you can look at them in your own time, um, you know, use them as revision notes, um, whatever. So they're, they're quite, quite colourful, so they should be uh, reasonably attractive to use. Okay, right, so let's make a start. Like I say, all of these things, they are um, tailored to the specification, um, so to make sure that they are absolutely watertight um well nearly um so uh, you can look at the specification basically it just matches that okay so we're going to start with the atom so the atom as you can see it's mainly made up of protons and neutrons they are very small and they contain um that are contained in the middle there you also have electrons that's whizzing around in um shells so these orbit the middle of the atom as you can see um you need to know these charges as well so protons have a positive charge as you can see um, there it is there, and neutrons have a zero charge, neutron neutral, electrons are negatively charged, so they have a minus one charge. Their relative masses you need to know is one, one, and one over 2,000 is the relative mass of an electron. You can't put no mass, an electron does have a mass, it's just very, very small. Um, and just to familiarize yourself with the, um, the elements in particular, so here's lithium, for example. The top number tells us the mass number, it's the number of protons and neutrons, in the nucleus, and the bottom number tells us are just the number of protons. We call this the atomic number or proton number. So, um, yeah, so all atoms, remember, are neutral uh, because the number of protons equals the number of electrons. Okay, right, so let's look at some ions and isotopes. So, you've got to know the difference between these. Um, we'll start with ions first. So, ions have a different number of electrons and protons. Um, so um, they basically don't have equal amounts like we looked at in an atom. So for example, if we look at negative ion, O2 minus has gained two electrons to get a full stable shell of electrons. So um, you can see here that um, the protons in this particular one here, that we have eight protons, which give a charge of plus eight, eight neutrons, remember they have no charge, so they don't, um, they don't count. Electrons, we've got 10 electrons in O2 minus, that means it gives it a minus two charge. So the total charge on this is minus two, and that's how we work out them charges, okay? So uh, this basically allows them to form these stable ionic compounds. They gain stability by being attracted to positive ions. Okay, so let's look at a positive ion. This is sodium. Uh, sodium is the opposite. It has one electron in its outer shell. It's in group one. Um, it uh, loses an electron uh, to form a Na plus ion. And um, you can see the same calculation I've done. Protons, 11 protons it's got. 12 neutrons, which have no charge. Um, and electrons, because it's lost an electron, it now only has 10 electrons. So the charge is at minus 10. Now if you do plus 11, 0, and minus 10, you get an overall charge of plus 1. That's why sodium has got a positive charge. Okay, isotopes, right. These are elements with the same number of protons but a different number of neutrons. So um, they have a different mass, effectively. So these are slightly different. So let's look at these three examples here. This is three examples of carbon. Carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14. Um, and let's just look at the different numbers. You can see we've got the protons, neutrons, and electrons here. Um, now, if we look here, they've got the same number of protons each all of these isotopes too, but crucially the number of neutrons is different. So carbon-12 has six neutrons, carbon-13 has seven, and carbon-14 has eight neutrons. So these are isotopes of each other, okay? Chemically they react the same because they have the same number of electrons, um, but they have a slightly different mass. Okay, right, we need to know a little bit about the history. This is the fun bit, okay? Back in 1803, John Dalton, he uh, came up with this idea that atoms are all spheres, a uh, very simple idea. Uh, and it wasn't until um, a good while later, nearly 100 years later, that J.J. Thompson had a good go at trying to change the model that Dalton came up with. He discovered the electron. Uh, and the atom, he said basically the atom wasn't solid and it was made up of other particles. And he named it the plum pudding model. Um, so basically he said that you had the positive pudding bit, which is this bit here. And inside the pudding you had negative electrons, which are the yellow circles there. And that's what Thompson came up with. Um, very shortly after that, um, 
Ernest Rutherford caught the atom, the, the atomic bug, I suppose, and he discovered the nucleus, um, and also discovered that the nucleus was really, really, really small, uh, and actually the nucleus contained positive charges. So he basically said that most of the atom was empty space um, because the nucleus was so small. And he said we had a cloud of electrons that was surrounding this nucleus. So you can see now we're starting to resemble more like the atom that we know today. Um, and he proved this using the gold leaf experiment. Um, basically what he did is he fired alpha particles at a very thin bit of gold leaf uh, and most of the alpha particles went through. Now that tells him that most of it was empty space. So that kind of, that's where he got his idea from. Um, but some did deflect back, very, very small number. And so what they must have done is they've hit a small positive nucleus because um, an alpha particle is positively charged. So, um, so it's actually hit the nucleus and it's bounced back. Some of it was deflected. Some of it bounced straight back, right back at the, um, at the, 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 uh, the source of the alpha. Okay, so 1913, again, look, not many years later, um, Niels Bohr had a go of it, so they really got the, the atomic bug here, and he discovered a problem with Rutherford's uh, model, and basically he said, well, the electron cloud could collapse, because it would obviously fold into the positive charged nucleus, um, and so he said, well, actually, you couldn't just have a cloud, you had fixed energy levels, and this is where the shell came up with. Now, basically, um, the uh, he... Uh, prove this because actually when he shone electromagnetic radiation um, it was absorbed by the atom and the electrons move between the shells that's what he noticed and when they do this they emit radiation when the electrons move back down to a lower energy level now this could only be explained using a shell model and um, you couldn't explain this using the cloud model so um, this basically um, kind of cemented Niels Bohr uh, idea of the atom okay um, and obviously the model today uh, we know that actually yes there are shells but we now know of the existence of subshells um, and basically we can use the ionization trends to explain this which we'll look at later okay um, the time of flight mass spectrometer so this is basically uh, mass spectrometry but using time of flight uh, the first bit when you add your sample it's vaporized um, so it can travel through the time of flight mass spectrometer so we turn it into a gas basically um, then we ionize it now we can ionize this using a uh, we call it electro spray ionization it basically works when we spray uh, a sample through a high pressure jet it's like putting your thumb of a hose pipe it's really high pressure jet uh, and basically what they do is they pass a really high voltage through this jet uh, and this causes the loss of an electron um, and um, what we get is a gaseous positively charged sample is made um, and this is really important because we need ionization for the next stage which is acceleration um, so you can see there there's the blue particle look um, they're moving through and um, so these are accelerated by negatively charged plates on electric fields um, and basically the particles with a lower mass to charge ratio or mz ratio will accelerate quicker so they'll move through a little bit quicker okay um, and the next bit is the basically it's the iron drift this is a bit weird now you can see the red ones zipped through there and the blue ones a little bit slower um, but the particles travel through with a constant speed and kinetic energy so um, if I just go if I just go back you can see that both the traveling at the same speed and the and the blue one they're traveling at a constant speed sorry not the same speed traveling at a constant speed but they do have between them they have a different speed each but their speed is is the same in terms of the the atom so in other words the red atom constantly travels through it doesn't speed up or slow down as it goes through the iron drift it travels through at a constant speed but the blue one goes slower um, and then the final stage is detection. So once it's drifted through, um, obviously the blue's going a bit slower than the red, then um, it basically an electrical current is made when the particle hits the plate at the back. Um, and basically ones with a lower MZ, in other words, lighter particles, will reach the detector first as they travel the fastest. So we have effectively separated our different parts out when we're detecting them at the other side. Okay, right. Your definitions, right, you need to know these. I can't emphasize this enough. All right, relative atomic mass. You can probably read them there, pretty straightforward. Relative atomic mass is the average mass of an atom of an element when measured on a scale on which the mass of an atom of carbon-12 is exactly 12. Basically, we're measuring everything relative to carbon-12. The relative molecular mass, so this is very similar. If you look, the average mass of a molecule when measured on a scale uh, which the mass of an atom is carbon-12 is exactly 12. So this is a molecule instead of an atom. 
And a relative isotopic mass is basically the mass of an atom of an isotope with an element measured on a scale in which the mass of an atom of carbon-12 is exactly 12. So there's a lot of carbon-12 being mentioned here. You've just got to know these, really. Okay, let's look at the mass spectra. Okay, so here we are. We've got a, um, this one we're going to look at isotopes. Um, so we've got an element here, and it's made up of isotopes. Now, the first thing we need to look at, really, um, is the um, the axes. So you can see here that we've got a mass to charge ratio at the bottom. Um, this is basically the mass of the isotope divided by the charge. Um, and most do have a plus one charge. Um, and so this makes it the same as the isotopic mass, um, which makes it relatively straightforward. If it's um, had two electrons knocked off, which would be quite rare, um, then the obviously the mass to charge ratio will be half as much. Um, so that's quite, that's quite important because um, obviously the Z bit um, stands for charge. So if you've got a double charge, it's just the mass of the isotope divided by two. Okay, um, the bit on the side, read this really carefully. I mean, this is the abundance. Um, it's always shown on the left, but this one, it can be written as a percentage or a nominal value. So it can be just a relative abundance. This one's percentage abundance. So this means that all your isotopes must give 100% if it's a percentage abundance, because obviously you can't get bigger than 100%. Okay. Um, so you can see here, if we add the 75 and uh, 25, we can get 100% from there. Okay, so this spectra shows two isotopes of one element. So we've got one element going through here made up of two isotopes. And we know this because we've only got two peaks. So we've got one isotope that has uh, a mass of 35 and one that has a mass of 37. And um, this is assuming, obviously, they have a one plus charge. So um, you can see here that the most abundant, which means the most common isotope, is uh, isotope 35, whatever this is. Uh, 37 isn't as common. Okay. Right, so... And from all this information, we can work out the relative atomic mass, which we're going to look at now, which is pretty useful. Okay, so let's work out the relative atomic mass of these. You need to know this formula. Um, relative atomic mass is the abundance of isotope A times by the mz of A. So that's the mass to charge ratio of A plus the abundance of B times by the mz of B. And if you had more than two, um, you would just literally keep adding up the abundance of A, abundance of B, and abundance of C, etc. You just keep adding them up. So basically... Um, you you keep adding loads of these brackets, repeating it for each isotope, divided by the total abundance. Now, because this one's percentage abundance, our total abundance is going to be 100, but it might not be percentage, so kind of look out for that. Okay, so let's look at this. Relative, ato ice, uh, relative atomic mass, sorry, is going to be 75 times 35, because the abundance of A is 75. The uh, mass of A is 35, mass to charge, sorry, is 35. So we do 75 times 35 plus... 25 times 37, so that's them two, uh, divided by 100 equals 35.5. And if you're smart enough, you can look in the periodic table and you can identify that as chlorine. Um, so you've effectively identified your element from your mass spectrometer. So that's pretty nice and straightforward. Um, you can also do it through tables as well. Um, you don't have to give it through spectra. Um, similar thing, this one's got more isotopes, as you can see. We don't know what the element is or the relative atomic mass, but we're going to try and work it out so here's that equation again look all we're doing is we're taking the isotope multiplying it by the abundance 20.5 there it is 70 times by 20.5 plus and then here's your other isotopes i was talking about so you just basically add them up it is a percentage abundance so we divide it by 100 if it's not then we just add these numbers up and divide by the total of them numbers okay so the answer is in this case is 72.6 this means that this element is germanium and you can have a look in the periodic table and check that out uh, right, molecules. Um, you don't need to know a lot about molecules at AS, um, thankfully. Um, so um, not for the first year anyway. Um, you need to know a little bit more for the second year, but not for the first year. Um, just to show you, look, I've changed the axes on the left. This is um, this is obviously relative abundance. Um, so I've changed it slightly. It's not percentage abundance anymore. So we just add up all these masses if we want to work out the the, the total amount okay uh, molecules are different um so we've got our mz there um molecules are different because when we send them through the mass spectrometer they actually break into little bits and we call them fragments um you don't worry too much about fragments at as um but the um the fragments uh have a mass and um basically we have an instead of isotopes that like we have in an element we have these bits and these fragments obviously form the uh, the spectra that we can see here. The most significant thing that we need to know is the m plus one peak. Basically, this is this uh, peak shows the uh, fragments of the um, 
uh, that hasn't been broken up. So basically, if we had, say, if we had ethane, for example, uh, this is unfragmented ethane. The whole thing has been ionized and the whole molecule has gone through because some molecules aren't fragmented. Um, and basically, we get what we call a molecular iron peak, which is always the last significant peak on the spectra. So in this case, the last one in here is 50. So we can know that this molecule has a MZ or a mass of 50. Um, so that's pretty much all you need to know about that. Okay, just looking at electro configuration, um, we need to know that electrons are split into four subshells. We have the S, the P, the D, and the F. Okay, and we need to know how to re how we how we write these um, these uh, electron configurations as well. So S is only one orbital that's spherical; it can only hold two electrons. Your P are like in a figure of eight, um, and they hold um, two electrons each each orbital but we have p we have three p orbitals so in total we can fit six electrons in the p subshell uh, the d orbitals are the um you, you, again you only fit two in each orbital and um, but we have five of them so in total we could fit 10 electrons in the d sub uh, subshell and the f block uh, is that funny block that's kind of detached away from the product table right at the bottom. Uh, these basically have seven orbitals and you could fit 14 electrons in total here. So let's look at the um, the uh, the shell number first. So if we look at an atom, the first shell only has one S orbital. That's all it has. Uh, and the maximum we can hold is two. So we've done that in green to match. In shell number two in an atom, um, we have the two S orbital. You can see now we've still got an S orbital, but now it's the two S orbital. And now we start to get into p orbitals, electrons in p orbitals. Again, we can fit a maximum of eight electrons in the second shell um, because we can have six in the p. In the third shell, um, we can have we now have a d orbital. And d orbitals, remember, can hold 10 electrons. So if we have two in the s, remember this is 3s, 3p, and 3d. Um, because we have three in the s, um, then, um, so because we have two electrons that can fit in the s, we have a two there. Uh, we have two lots of uh, three p orbitals, uh, or three lots of three p orbitals with two electrons each. Um, so, and you can see here that we've got five, uh, five d orbitals here, which is five times two, and that's eighteen. Okay, so this just basically shows you how it's all structured. Okay, so let's look at the electric configuration. Okay, of of an atom. So uh, basically, we need to know that they're written like this: one s two. The first number here tells you the shell number. The letter bit here tells you the subshell that we've just looked at before, and the number bit tells you the number of electrons in that subshell. So let's look at the electron configuration of iron. Okay, um, so you can see here that we've got 26 protons. This is elemental iron, so we've also got 26 electrons. So basically, we just need to look and see what the electron configuration is. What I've done is we've drawn an energy level diagram to show you how these orbitals uh, correspond to each other in terms of energy. So we have 1s2. Uh, basically, we've got to get 26 electrons. 2s2. So you can see here that we've got the second shell now. Uh, s orbital. We've got two electrons in the s orbital. And we represent them with a box. The boxes, the little arrows, show electrons spinning. So spinning in opposite directions. Okay. 2p6. 3s2. And you can see we're filling them up. Remember the p orbital? You can have three orbitals in there. Uh, p sub shell, so we can have three orbitals. Uh, 3p6. And then 4s2. Now it's a bit weird. If you look here, your 4s2 is lower in energy than your 3d. This doesn't have to be in numerical order. Um, but uh, yeah, your 4s is lower than your 3d. So we fill that one first. Uh, and then we have 3d6. Um, and so obviously this tells us the electrical configuration of iron. Um, and you can see that configuration there. Okay, so check. They must give, or they should add to give 26. So just check, check them answers there, okay? We always fill from the lowest energy upwards. So we start from the 1s first. We can't start from 2p or anything. You have to start from the 1s. And um, we fill orbitals singly as well first. Then we pair them up. So if you look in that top row there where we're pointing to, you can see that we've got these electrons that are single. In other words, they don't put that electron in that orbital. They prefer to sit separately uh, in their own orbital unless they have to pair up because there's no other orbitals left. Okay, so um, and this is because we've obviously got electrons off the same charge and we've got a bit of repulsion going on. Okay, let's just look at some ions. So with ions, you just add or remove the electrons from the highest energy level first. 
So transition metals behave a little bit differently, but we'll have a look at them later. So let's look at the electric configuration for calcium 2 plus. What this does is this loses two electrons um, and you lose the two from the 4s. So let's just have a look. There's the 4s2 and there it goes, it disappears. And what we're left with is your 3p6 um, because we've taken the electrons from the 4s2. Uh, and basically, we need to check check the small numbers. So they should give um, these numbers here, if you add them up, it should give 20 minus 2, because we're taking two electrons away, is 18. If we add all them up, it should give 18. Okay, so we lose from the 4s. Okay, there it goes, and it disappears. Okay, transition metals are a little bit different. Um, you've got to be careful with these. Chromium and copper in particular, okay, so they behave differently. So an electron from the 4s orbital actually moves into the 3d orbital to create a more stable half full or full 3d uh, subshell respectively, okay. So if we look at chromium, okay, so the uh, electron configuration of chromium um, is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d5, 4s1. So what we've done is we've removed an electron from the um, uh, the uh, 4s orbital, um, or the 3d orbital, should I say. So we've removed an electron from there. However, an electron from the 4s orbital has moved into the 3d subshell, so we've created a half-full subshell. So what we don't do is we don't take from the, um, basically we don't have this situation here, where we take from the d orbital and we still have two in the s orbital. So this is a bit unusual, really. So um, so these things behave a little bit differently as well. Uh, so your metal ions, these behave a bit strange. So if we look at the electrical configuration for Fe3+, um, so basically what it does is it loses three electrons and two from the 4s and one from the 3d, okay, which is a bit strange. So normally you would think you would remove from this one first um, because it's a of energy. But when you're removing from a transition metal, because these things are so close in energy, we actually remove these ones first. Um, it's more stable, less energy to do that. Then we start picking away from the 3D. So let's just have a look. Um, there it is there. This is the electron configuration for uh, iron. And what we're going to do is we're going to remove, there you go, the electrons from there. And we've got 3d5 let's just go back look that so we take three electrons the 4s2 goes 3d6 turns into 3d5 let's look at it uh, in terms of the numbers if you add them up it should give 26 minus 3 which is 23 so just check the little numbers there look at this diagram there it is loosen the 4s there you go then from the 3d and there's the configuration okay so you've got to loosen the 4s first right let's look at ionization so this is the minimum amount of energy required to remove one mole of electrons from one mole of atoms in the gaseous state. You must, all these bits which are underlined, you've got to remember, it's always one mole, one mole of atoms, one mole of electrons, etc. Always got to be in the gaseous state as well. I know it looks a bit weird when you've got, when you're ionizing sodium and sodium's in the gas state or gaseous state, but it's always got to be like that, okay? So let's look at sodium. Sodium is Na. Uh, forms Na plus plus one electron. This is the first ionization energy of sodium and it's given the value there. You don't obviously have to remember these values, okay? Always include your state symbols, like I say. And ionization energy always, ionization, sorry, always requires energy. Um, so um, these things are always endothermic. Um, so they always have a positive value, okay? That's always with all ionizations, okay? Um, we need to know about the effects of shielding. This is quite important. Uh, basically, the more shells or electron shells that we have between the positive nucleus and the outer electron, the less energy is required. And um, we've got a weaker attraction here. So there's your positive nucleus. Look at this atom. It's got loads of shells here. There's the outer electron. So trying to take an electron from there is going to be a little bit easier than taking an electron from there because we've got a stronger attraction between the positive and the outer electron compared with this one. This one has more shielding. Okay. Atomic size, that's obviously going to play a role as well. So the bigger the atom, the further away the electrons are from the nucleus, the attractive force is weaker. So therefore it takes less energy to remove that outer electron. And the nuclear charge is pretty important as well. So the more protons in the nucleus, the bigger the attraction is between the nucleus and the outer electron. Um, so this means more energy is required to remove the electron. This is particularly useful if you're looking at trends going across a period, which we'll look at um, 
later on. Okay, right. So let's look at successive ionization energy. So this is basically removing an electron from an atom. So we're constantly taking, take the first electron, then we take the second, then we take the third, then we take the fourth, etc. So that's what we're going to do here. So the removal of one of, of, sorry, the removal of more than one electron from the same atom is called a successive ionization. So here's magnesium. We're going to remove an electron from something that's already positively charged. This is called the second ionization energy. Look, it's a little bit bigger compared to the one um, which would be for the first ionization. So um, this is the second one here. So it takes a little bit more energy. We're trying to remove something from something that's already positively charged. That's going to take some energy to do. Okay, so you can see we've got some distinctive jumps here. Um, so we've got jump here and we've got a jump here. Now these jumps are because we're removing an electron from a shell that's increasingly closer to the nucleus um, because it's close to the nucleus remember this is the nucleus that holds these electrons in so um, this is going to take a lot more energy to do you can see there's a general increase in energy moving an electron from an increasingly more positive ion like i said um so yeah okay so let's have a look at some of these now you can see we're removing um, these electrons here now these electrons are sitting in the 3s orbital remember these are the ones furthest away from the nucleus so we're starting here these are these two electrons here. These sit in the 3s. If we look along, the next lot are the ones in the second shell. Now, the second shell is much closer to the nucleus. So we have, um, obviously, we've got six in the p orbital and two in the s orbital. But this is what these electrons represent. Remember, we've got this generally increasing shell. Then, if we want to remove the ones from the first shell, the one closest to the nucleus, we're going to need to put a significantly more energy in. Now, for the exam, you need to know these jumps. You need to be able to explain them. So it's all about trying to take an electron for something that's closer to the nucleus. Okay, so we know if we look at this element here, obviously we know this is magnesium as because this element has 12 electrons and you can see the 12 down there. There it is there, okay? Right, first ionization trends. So we need to know about this in terms of the groups. So this is going down group two in particular. Now, just to kind of quickly show you the graph. First ionization energy, this is the energy required to remove one electron from each one of these elements. So we we'll start with beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, etc. So um, basically the ionization decreases as we go down the group. And this is the reason why. So we've got the atomic radius as we go down the group uh, gets bigger. Uh, and the electrons become further away from the nucleus. So this means the attractive force between the outer electrons and the nucleus is weaker. And this means the energy needed to remove that electron is obviously going to be less um, because it's obviously got a weaker force. Also, shielding. How many times has this come up? Shielding is so important. Shielding increases as we go down the group. More shells between the nucleus and the outer shell. So the attractive force is going to be weaker. Really important, that one. Uh, and the energy is required to remove... Uh, an electron decreases. So we've got two things here, the ionic radius and shielding. Okay, shielding plays a big role in here. Um, and if we just go back to our history of the uh, of the atom, this data provides strong evidence for shells. Remember Niels Bohr said there were shells. Um, and so um, so this, this is the evidence that, uh, that would back that up. But However, it didn't explain data showing going across a period. So this is how we know Niels Bohr's model isn't quite, uh, not quite there. It's not quite the finished article. Okay, so let's have a look at the one when we're going across a period. So that's going down a group. Okay, so this is going across a period. Uh, now, generally, the ionization energy increases as we go across a period. So you can see from this graph here, there it is. Okay, you can see it's generally going up. I've picked um, the, the elements going from sodium all the way to argon. So it's going across a period. Remember, periods are going along the periodic table. Uh, and all we're doing is we're just taking one electron from each one of these elements and measuring how much energy it takes. Now, this is a bit trickier. There's your general increase. Okay, The reason why we have a general increase is because as we go across the period, we have one more proton compared to the previous element. So this increases that nuclear attraction that we were talking about. Uh, shielding is similar, so actually um, it's still an important point. We need to say that it's similar uh, in your answers, um, but it doesn't have any effect really. Um, so yeah, it actually marginally decreases um, So um, because the uh, distance from the nucleus 
is effectively getting a little bit smaller, um, but it's not it's not significant enough um, to cause too many problems in terms of energy, but the shielding is similar. Uh, more energy is required to remove that electron, so the ionization energy increases. Okay, now we do have some exceptions here, and the examiners are going to pick up on these. So you can see here this one and this one. So we're just going to look at what these exceptions are. Okay, so you can see that we've got a decrease at aluminium. That's the first one that we pointed to. This is evidence for having subshells. Okay, remember this is beyond Niels Bohr model. So the outermost electron in aluminium sits in a higher energy subshell, slightly further away from the nucleus than the outer electron in magnesium. So um, if you see here, there's aluminium, look, 3p1. You can see magnesium doesn't have an electron in the 3p orbital, um, but aluminium does. Now, because it's a little bit further away from the nucleus and it's slightly shielded from the 3s orbital, this is going to mean that we don't need much energy basically to um, to remove it and it drops slightly so magnesium's out electrons in that 3s orbital so the atomic model Niels Bohr came up with didn't explain this theory that's quite important okay right let's look at the next one along this one's a little bit trickier this is sulfur um, now there's a decrease at sulfur this is evidence for electron repulsion this time in the orbital so um, if we look at the element before which is phosphorus um, phosphorus and sulfur, um, they both actually have electrons in the 3p orbital, so the shielding is the same. So we're not talking about shielding now um, in this one. The shielding is actually the same. Um, however, this is the energy diagram for sulfur. As you can see here, There's the that's the setup there. So we've got the 3p. Even phosphorus, phosphorus should just have three electrons in there. Um, so they've got the same shielding. But if we're removing an electron from sulfur, it involves taking it from an orbital with two electrons already in it. Okay, so there's the two electrons there. Now, remember what we said last time. Electrons in the same um, uh, orbital repel each other. That's not very good in terms of energy. So, the electrons repel. So, less energy is needed to remove an electron from an orbital with two in compared to with one with phosphorus. This is the configuration for phosphorus. It doesn't have that paired electron, therefore it takes a little bit more energy. This one is paired, a bit of repulsion here, won't put up much of a fight in terms of trying to take this electron, so the energy drops, and we don't need as much energy. Okay, so um, that is basically it. Um, like I say, um, this is just a, a very brief overview of atomic structure. Um, these... Um, uh, these PowerPoints, like I say, they can be purchased. Um, so if you just click on the link below uh, in the uh, description box, uh, you'll be able to um, access them from there if you if you would like them. But uh, I hope that helps. Bye bye.